my story starts in a seventh grade classroom. The teacher asks the students to sit down with colored pencils and draw what they think a scientist looks like. So right now, just for fun, think about a scientist. Okay, one little girl, Amy, draws this. Draws this. This is perfect, right? <laughs> this is what I think of when you say scientist, and I am a scientist. But the genius part is that these teachers then took the students to a real research lab where they met real scientists and they learned about their work. And when they returned to the classroom, they were asked to redraw the assignment. And then Amy draws this. <laughs> and she writes, scientists are normal people. <laughs> this is it. I think if we can take this idea of normal people doing science, we can engage more young students in science. Because science is everywhere. Science is in the car you drive, it's in the medicine you take. So what's the problem? The problem is science got boring, right? I don't know when science got boring for you. My high school biology textbook was not amazing. I think that we're inundating young students with textbooks and worksheets, and we're losing the interesting stories of science. And that's really too bad. I haven't been a scientist for long, but in my short career, I have found that science is about exploration. It's about going out into the natural world and rediscovering your inner seventh grader. And it's about innovation. It's about starting from humble beginnings and creating something completely new. And ultimately, it's about discovery. But not just what we discover, but how we discover it the characters and the stories, the successes and the failures that occur along the way, they're all just as important. Now, right now, we have scientists communicating the products of their discovery. And the problem is that some scientists can't convey their research in a meaningful way for a broad audience. So they can't tell a good story. And I think that every scientist is obligated to communicate their work to some extent. But there are only so many hours in the day, and at the end of it, don't we want our scientists doing good science? So we just need a little bit of help. I think that we just need to incorporate the human narrative back into our stories about science. And this way, we can engage a broader audience. But before I get into the stories and characters of science, let me start by giving you my story. This is me. Um, about a year ago, on one of the most amazing research expeditions I've ever been lucky enough to go on. I'm a PhD student who studies marine biology. I travel to some of the most remote places on Earth to find out how coral reefs work. But I didn't start here. Um, I started here. <laughs> and I didn't grow up wanting to be a scientist. In fact, there was a period in high school where I really wanted to do art. And I used to refer to this as my rebellious art phase. But as I was writing this talk, I realized that actually that's not it at all. Because I always liked science. It's just that I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel smart enough. Only the top, top nerdy students were good at science, and that wasn't me. And this feeling followed me all the way through my education. And I remember calling my mom once in college and being like, I don't think I can cut it as a scientist. And at that point, she was convinced that I was just afraid of math and that I needed to continue on. And that was partly true, and I did. Um, but, you know, it's been, like, so amazing getting into science. And as I've gotten into it, I've realized that there's a gap between what scientists are communicating and what the public is receiving. And this is never more apparent to me than when I sit down on an airplane and someone asks me what I do, and I say, I'm a marine biologist, and then they think that I do this. <laughs> I have to tell you, um, on behalf of marine biologists everywhere, that unfortunately, uh, very few of us can speak intelligently about dolphins. Um, but I began to wonder, if I could tell people my story, could I change their perception of scientists? Can we change the public's perception of science? 
Now, this is a formula that's worked in the past. We've used a charismatic character, and we've engaged the public on scientific issues. Jane Goodall, one of my heroes growing up, got us interested in primates. Jacques Cousteau introduced us to the underwater world. And even Steve Irwin got us excited about crocodiles and conservation. And it wasn't because we liked crocodiles, right? I mean, I do not like crocodiles. It was their passion. It was their enthusiasm. It was Steve's crikey. It was contagious. And not, while none of these characters are popular on television today, this is a formula that works. We just need to update it. So to do that, let's take a look at what's popular today. <laughs> like it or not, reality TV is a big part of our culture. Facebook, Twitter. All of these things are things we love to love or love to hate. But either way, there's no denying that they're a huge part of our culture. And the question is, why? <laughs> they're all about stories. They're all about characters. They're about building your online narrative. Imagine if we could take this power and harness it for good, instead of for watching crazy girls fight on The Bachelor. Because science has no lack of interesting stories and characters. For example, meet Greg Mitchell. <laughs> Dr. Greg Mitchell is one of our professors at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And he has a photograph available online that looks exactly like Amy's drawing. But there is much more to him than this image. Greg Mitchell is a scientist, but he also plays the harmonica, has been known to break dance, and stand on his head. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. Through a series of collaborations, classes, and videos, I'm working to engage the public by using scientists as my main characters. So I teach a course about storytelling in science, and I collaborate with students to make short videos about research. And I think that in this way, we can reach a broader audience. So when we make these videos, uh, we'll typically start with a storyboard. And what I want to do is give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. So I'm actually going to storyboard with you a little bit right now. OK, so this is like a typical episode. I want you to meet Jenna Moore. Jenna is a graduate student with me at Scripps. And as you can imagine, it might be difficult to be a young woman in science who studies creepy, crawly, slimy things. Jenna studies Antarctic invertebrates. Now, in order to convey her passion for these organisms to the public, Jenna has actually created a metric of cuteness. So each one of her animals is graded on a scale. Now, if you were going to have a scale of cuteness, what unit would you want to use? Kittens, right? I mean, what's cuter than a kitten? So in this case, this particular squishy starfish is equal to six kittens. I think we can all agree that that's pretty darn cute. Um, but every good story has a villain. And in this case, the villain is the king crab. Now, the king crab would love to get his claws on the squishy starfish. But luckily for the starfish, the king crab lives here in South America. And the squishy starfish lives here in Antarctica. So for now, the starfish is living in a community of invertebrates that are all soft-bodied, which means they're really vulnerable and also pretty yummy for the king crab. But for now, they're safe. However, due to climate change, the crabs, <laughs> the crabs are moving steadily south and at some point actually may reach the starfish habitat. So it's with the help of scientists like Jenna that we are working to better understand how climate change is impacting our planet. And one of the things that all of these scientists have in common is that they're all passionate about their work. All we need to do is take that passion to the public, and we'll be able to engage young scientists, in, uh, engage young students in science. Now, I think that we just need to change the traditional face of science by literally giving it new faces. Faces like Jenna's, faces like Greg's and mine. We're scientists, and we have stories to share. I'll leave you with one last story. And this one's about my mother. So my mother was a professional photographer. She's an artist. And she had two lessons for me growing up. Number one, you don't need a man. <laughs> but 
that's another TED Talk. <laughs> and number two, you can do science. She herself was fascinated with space. She used to let us stay up late some nights and stand in the front yard and peer through her modest telescope. I remember standing there barefoot and shivering in my PJs, but getting to watch the craters of the moon. And I asked her once why she didn't become a scientist. And she said that she didn't feel like she was smart enough. But she never tried. My mother grew up in an age when women weren't astronauts or journalists. But she taught me not to be afraid of failure or math. My story is just one of many. There are so many other much more accomplished scientists out there with incredible life stories to share. So I'll leave you with this. My mother didn't become a scientist, but she taught me that anyone can. And I, in turn, want to share the stories of science. For anyone fascinated with innovation, for every seventh grade classroom, not just the one in the story, for your inner seventh grader, it's my hope that this small idea of scientists as normal people will open up the world of science for anyone who dreams about it.